Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you joining us for this panel session. My name is Cicely Thomas. I'm a program director at Results for Development in Washington, DC, where I focus my portfolio of work on the integration of the private sector and innovations in government stewarded mixed health systems for universal health coverage. It's my pleasure today to be joined by several panelists for this um, fascinating panel on the application of machine learning approaches in resource constrained sessions. During this session, I will quickly introduce the panelists. We will then hear from, from them um, about their papers and we will have a Q&A session at the end of, of this time. Please, if you have um, difficulty during the session, you can put some you can you can request some support in the chat. I also encourage you to include questions during the session in um, the question function on the platform. I will be reading and curating those questions for the panelists at the end of the presentations. So it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists today, Dr. Krishna Kumar from the Indian Institute for Human Settlements and his colleague, Dr. Bohr will be joining us. Dr. Elizabeth Miranda, who is an integrated vascular surgery resident at the University of Southern California and a Paul Farmer Global Surgery Research Fellow at the Harvard Program in Global Surgery and Social Change. Dr. Pratap Kumar, who is a clinician, neuroscientist, health economist and social entrepreneur working at the interface of health scientists and healthcare markets based at Strathmore University Business School and his colleague, Dr. Sa Sa uh, Sati Rajasekara, who will also be joining for the Q&A and presenting on this panel. Dr. Priya Balu is joining us from the Public Health Foundation of India and her colleague, Dr. Cloma, Venus Cloma Rosales will also join as well. And finally, uh, last but not least, um, Dr. Godwin Anguzu will also be joining us. As I mentioned, please include um, your questions in the question function on the platform, as well as uh, take, a, take a go at answering the quiz that we have up um, on the screen. Um, and now I'm going to pass it over to uh, these our, our technical support to play these sessions. And we will reintroduce our speakers at the end of this for them to uh, join us and, and, and answer some of the questions that you all put forward. Thank you. Welcome, myself Krishna Kumar and Nilanjan Bohr presenting machine learning based predictive model for assessment of the relation between non communicable disease specific indicators and socio demographic index in south asian countries non communicable diseases encompasses a vast group of diseases such as cardiovascular diseases cancer diabetes and chronic respiratory diseases according to a study published by world bank in 2011 the total deaths in south asia due to ncds is projected to 72% by 2030 which is about 30% increase compared to that in 2008. This involves a double burden of disease, disability and premature death in many millions of people in low and middle income countries like South Asia. So this study is focused on the sustainable development goal three of indicator 3.4, where the major focus is to reduce premature mortality by one third from non-communicable diseases prevention and treatment and promote mental health and well-being. Among NCDs, cardiovascular diseases are the major and growing contributors to the mortality and disability. Hence, accurate national level incidence data on NCD risk factors, particularly for urban population are vital. Further, comorbid COVID-19 deaths implying strengthening of the NCD specific programs. Continuing with introduction, rural urban migration due to urbanization is increasing the population exposure to risk factors. This may be due to several factors, including differential exposure to motorized travel and pollution, occupational, physical activity, marketing and access to tobacco, alcohol, and processed food products. 
So far, there is really less focus on improving social and commercial determinants of health specific to NCDs. Further, NCDs have potentially serious socioeconomic consequences through increasing individual and household impoverishment and hindering social and economic development. The distribution and impact of NCDs and their risk factors is highly equitable, is highly inequitable and imposes a disappropriately large burden on low and middle income countries. NCDs became not only the disease of the poor, but also the wealthy. Therefore, the rapid rise in the magnitude of NCDs predicted to impede poverty reduction initiatives in low income and communities. Machine learning based data analysis can accelerate the decision making process by allowing an abstract context measurement to in depth analysis of the content. Today, Predictive analytics extensively uses machine learning for data modeling due to its ability to accurately process vast amounts of data and recognize its patterns. Coming to the methods, the Global Burden of Disease Study is the most comprehensive worldwide observational epidemiological study. Scaled data from 1990 to 2017 of eight South Asian countries were used for analyzing the association between five selected health related sustainable development indicators and socio demographic index. This include NCD mortality, occupational burden, air pollution mortality, household air pollution and universal health coverage index. The average values of these indicators and percentage SDI for the period 1990 to 2017 were plotted here. It can be observed that all these variables are positively correlated with SDI, Afghanistan having the lowest and Sri Lanka having the highest SDI values. India is standing on an average. Continuing with methods, while talking about SDI, it is a composite indicator of development status which strongly correlated with the health outcomes ranges from 0 to 1. We have computed the mean SDI value for South Asian countries as 0 0.39, whereas the global value is 0 0.63. The NCD specific indicators and SDI from the year 1990 to 2014 were used for training a neural network. The trained network is then used to predict the SDI values for the remaining years, that is from 2015 to 2017. Coming to the results, the correlation matrix shows the Pearson correlation coefficient between the variables. All the health related indicators are positively correlated with SDI and the risk factors tend to be positively correlated with one another with p-values less than 0 0.001. This indicates people with some risk factors have a greater chance of experiencing even more risk factors. For example, the correlation between air pollution mortality and NCD mortality is 0.86, which means the people living in areas with greater air pollution have higher chances of affected by NCDs. Further, some of the metabolic and behavioral risk factors tend to have a cumulative effect on the development of health issues, which means multiple risk factors have a greater likelihood of developing a condition that impacts their physical or mental health. Coming to the model performance, the quantitative evaluation of the STI prediction results for the years 2015 to 2017 is a mean absolute error of 3% and mean square error of 4.1% in comparison with the two SDI values. Further, a Pearson correlation coefficient value of 0 0.96 between true and predicted values of SDI and their distribution in the scatter diagram shows the potential of the machine learning model in dealing with multi-country and multi-ethnic data. To conclude, our analysis finds five major implications uh, for this study. Firstly, it was found that NCDs were very less researched in South Asia region and it was difficult to pull data set to perform data analysis using machine learning technique. Further, secondly, there is a need for country level data, especially data from urban areas to improve decision making to prevent NCDs at local and regional level. Thirdly, improving country level surveillance and monitoring 
must be a top priority in the fight against NCDs. Fourthly, besides targeting NCD behavioral and metabolic risk factors, it is essential to improve the social and commercial determinants of health, also contributing to NCD mortality. Finally, during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond, it is required strengthening of the health systems to address the double burden of disease by improving public health funding, infrastructure, health workforce, resources, and local governance. With this, we conclude our presentation here and thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to present our work on the standardization of image capture uh, for machine learning in low resource settings. We'd like to thank the following for making this research possible. So cesarean sections or C-sections are the most commonly performed surgical procedure in the world. And this is increasing every year, particularly in low and middle income countries. Uh, C-section, SSI, or surgical site infection rates are increasing as well. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the rate is reported anywhere between 7 and 48%. In rural Rwanda, which is where this study takes place, uh, our team has previously reported the post-C-section SSI rate at about 11%. These can cause significant morbidity and mortality when they're not treated in a timely manner. However, community health workers, or CHWs, may be a resource to help detect and treat these SSIs early um, and just prevent the morbidity, mortality, and financial cost that comes with this. Another tool that could possibly be used to address this is uh, our image-based algorithms, which are developed using machine learning. And these machine learning algorithms can help fill diagnostic gaps that are seen oftentimes in low and middle income countries or LMICs. The photograph on the right is from previous work done by this group which used about 500 photographs to develop an algorithm that would predict whether or not women would be diagnosed with SSI or no SSI. And it used characteristics of the photographs that were taken, such as the lightness, the blueness, and the redness, um, to predict this diagnosis. And as you can see, the, the algorithm was very successful, highly sensitive and, and specific in predicting SSI diagnosis. Um, however, in order to develop these kinds of algorithms, yeah, you need to be able to standardize the images that are used to train the algorithm. And if the image capture process is not standardized, this means a huge amount of time and resources uh, of manual processing in order to use these images for the algorithms. This is further complicated in LMICs where training and personnel are even harder to come by at times. So the goal of our study was to develop a standardized method of image capture to develop a machine learning algorithm specifically to predict SSI diagnosis after C-section. And this was for women at a Crehe at, at Crehe District Hospital in rural Rwanda. Rwanda is a small country in East Africa with about 12 million people. And the photograph on the right shows Crehe District Hospital. So all women at this hospital who underwent C-section between September of last year and February of this year were enrolled. Our study process is outlined here, and you can see the different time points at which photographs were taken. So the first was by study data collectors at postoperative day three, which is about when most women were discharged home. On postoperative day 10, CHWs would go to the patient's homes and take photographs there. And then finally, on postoperative day 11, women would come back to the hospital where they were assessed by doctors or general practitioners. Um, so at that time, our study team would take photographs and then the doctors would examine the patient to determine whether or not she had an infection. So these are all the tools that we needed in order to uh, facilitate this process. So the wound screener container application was developed specifically for this study with our partners at MIT. And it contained a small survey uh, with information about the patient and the photograph, as well as the actual application to take the photo. Um, this was used on a smartphone and in conjunction with a computer vision target, which you can see on the right. So this target was meant to ensure that uh, the image application recognized when the photo was being taken and also to prevent 
any excess information from being included in the image, like patients' clothes or bed sheets and so on. Uh, there was a special natural light lamp that we used to prevent shadowing in the image as well, and then materials to protect all of these tools during transport. So this outlines the photo taking process. After logging in, you'd select a specific patient's profile where all of their images were stored and fill out that survey that I mentioned previously, um, and then use the sanitized target uh, to place over the patient's incision, light the incision uh, to prevent shadowing, um, and then finally capture the image. And all of these photographs were uploaded and stored on a cloud server and hard drive. So two of the study team members uh, actually went to Boston for a week-long training with the app developers at MIT, and then they subsequently returned to Rwanda to lead the in-country training. So there were two sessions of the in-country training, one for the study team who were more familiar with this type of technology um, and just made them comfortable with the app itself, with the image capture process and protocol and any troubleshooting. The community health workers underwent a separate training and it was more extensive because in their case, they would be traveling to the patient's homes. So they would have less support if anything went wrong during the photo capture process. So the training gave them a lot of time to practice, I mean, become really familiar with the process. They also were trained in any app troubleshooting in case they ran into problems there. Um, some of the community health workers had done a similar previous study, so they had about 20 hours of training, but for the new CHWs, they had more training sessions um, and more extensive opportunities to practice. Overall, 808 women were enrolled and over 2,000 images were captured. As you can see at a few points along the way, um, women either missed uh, their photo being taken or they were excluded from the study, so their photos weren't taken then. The majority of women returned back to the clinic though on post-operative day 11, so our study data collectors at that time tried to take as many photos as possible. Uh, the images on the right are examples of the type of photographs that we were able to produce using this process. Um, as you can see, they would include just the incision itself and then the skin surrounding the incision. Uh, along the way, we did face a few technical challenges. You can see in the top photo, um, sometimes image clarity uh, wasn't the best and lighting was also a challenge in some of these houses. Um, so we were constantly reviewing the photographs and working with the community health workers and data collectors to see if there's anything we could improve along the way to prevent those photographs. Um, the target size initially also was too big and so had to be reduced uh, a few weeks into the study. Uh, and then finally, there are some challenges with troubleshooting the application with the development team being in the U.S. and the implementing team being in Rwanda. But overall, we found that this standardization of C-section wound images was very feasible in this setting. Uh, we would recommend in the future uh, that tools and training be really tailored to the people who are using them and who are taking these photographs. Ideally, developers and implementing teams should be located close by um, so that troubleshooting and any adjustments that need to be made can, be happen, can happen quickly. And finally, regular monitoring of the image quality was essential. Uh, just to make sure that any adjustments that needed to be made to the process could happen quickly. Thank you very much for your time. Hi everyone, my name is Pratap Kumar. I'm the CEO of HealthyNet, and I'm here with Sati, the CIO of Jacaranda Health. And we're here to present our work that combines artificial intelligence, specifically machine learning, with some mHealth approaches to support pregnant women in rural Kenya. Uh, this collaboration between Jacaranda Health and uh, HealthyNet, two social enterprises based in Kenya, in itself is something to highlight as this is a collaboration that's really addressing challenges that we are seeing on the ground and addressing this with local resources. So I'm gonna let Sati take over and tell you about what Jacaranda Health is doing. Great, so thanks Pratap. So as Pratap mentioned, uh, both our organizations work in Kenya and one of the biggest challenges um, in maternal and neonat neonatal health service delivery is that 
pregnant women and new mothers aren't getting to care at the right time or at the right place. Um, so on one hand, mothers may not be empowered with information. They may not, may not realize they need to be getting to care. Um, and on the other hand, the referral processes are challenging. So if a mom goes to one facility, she may be told that care is not available at that facility and she needs to go to another hospital, wasting valuable time in terms of providing urgent care. At Jacaranda, we uh, have a digital health platform, which is called Prompts, which is designed to get moms to care at the right place at the right time. So from a user perspective, Prompts is a simple two-way SMS messaging platform. Moms get information about their pregnancy or about how to take care of their newborn, um, and they're able to ask questions uh, of a help desk agent. Um, so they send in a question to the agent who may route them to care if he or she feels that additional support is required. At this point, we're at 300,000 moms enrolled on the platform, and that means we're re receiving almost 1,000 questions a day. So one of the, the problems we encountered as we were scaling up is we're getting thousands of questions a day. How do you triage those questions to identify what we call the red flag questions? So those questions that are about bleeding, for example, that need to be answered uh, within a very short period of time before a question that's more general in nature about nutrition, for example. And so we use machine learning, uh, specifically natural language processing, to sift through those messages, uh, identify the subject matter, and prioritize them for our help desk agents who then answer those questions and refer them on to care. But when it comes to referral, um, we also realize an additional layer of support is required. So that agent, you know, in this case study that we're sharing, may, may inform the mom that you know, bleeding is a danger sign, she needs to go for care, but that mom may be reluctant. And what becomes critical to resolve the issue is connecting that mom with a healthcare provider at the facility. So this handover process is incredibly important. And what we realized is as more and more of these cases were coming up, that handover needed to be structured. So documentation of the issues of, related to the case had to be set up in a very, uh, very structured format. And then it needed to be communicated in a relatively simple format. So the most commonly used systems in, in Kenya in terms of communication are feature phones or smartphones and text messaging is how everyone communicates with each other. And this is when we, we encountered Gabriel and HealthyNet uh, and discussed collaborating with Pratap and his team. Over to you, Pratap. Thanks, Sabi. So at HealthyNet, we have been trying to solve this problem of the really uh, short, the real shortage of skilled health workers all across Africa, and how do we utilize them as effectively and efficiently as possible? And in order to leverage technology, there are two main barriers that we're trying to overcome. One is training. We can't afford to train the hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers on each new technology. And um, so in order to overcome that, we need to integrate with existing workflows that's seamless for providers to continue working uh, with technology. The other is to make these uh, workflows as simple as and intuitive as possible so that again, it works like something familiar to them like WhatsApp, which is very easy to, uh, for all of us to take up and learn and use. And any technology should be as intuitive as that. The other big barrier is the infrastructure needed to get all these people into digital uh, platforms. And BYOD stands for bring your own device. So most healthcare providers have a phone or a device that they can bring in uh, and are willing to bring into healthcare, uh, into healthcare delivery. And so it's our task to try and make any phone a basic dumb phone or a smartphone uh, and utilize that to make healthcare more efficient and effective. Uh, the technology that we use on top of that is browser-based. We don't force people to uh, install new apps that need new learning and existing technology that is on the smartphone can be utilized for supporting these processes. And of course, everything needs to be offline first uh, because of the bandwidth challenges. So the next slide, we have a brief uh, overview of how this technology works for different people in a schematic. So patients with a basic phone can send a text to a nurse who can text or call back 
Uh, they can document cases which is sent as an SMS link to a doctor with a phone who reviews the case on their device, uh, sends a link for a video call or a basic call uh, to the patient. Information was also sent to labs and pharmacies who can complete the circle with some deliveries. Uh, so using this technology, we've done uh, supported healthcare delivery all across Kenya. So in the next slide, you see that we have supported over 200 consultations all, of, all over Kenya uh, with minimal upfront costs for a wide range of primary care consultations. And our study in Turkana showed that this ability for healthcare providers to work digitally with their patients and remote providers really increases their morale and interest in supporting healthcare locally. So I'll let uh, Sati take over and tell you what we've been doing with Jacaranda Health. Great, so what we've, we've been able to successfully set up is the, the infrastructure to support referrals for maternal emergencies or neonatal emergencies. And so on the left, what you see is what a provider um, may see on their phone, which is a notification that a, an emergency case has come up uh, and that person has been contacted, and the case has been discussed, and then you also see when the, the client arrives at the facility. Um, on the right-hand side, you see the kind of structured information that's essential for a provider. So maybe a case summary, um, documentations for reasons for why that person needs to be referred, and then a sequence or a timeline for what's going on with that client. All of this information is happening real time. And so where we are right now in terms of the collaboration is this, this this is active, this is being used by providers uh, across two counties in Kenya, um, and we're seeing the cases come up and be managed successfully. And as time goes by, we'll start to look at, you know, what the impact is in terms of successful referrals and health outcomes. And so just to conclude, um, to sort of highlight the, the reasons why this co collaboration has worked. Um, first, it's local. Um, you know, we were able to, to get up to up and running with, with a prototype within the matter of one or two months. Um, there's contextual insight in terms of knowing what devices work, what, what backend servers and systems to use. Um, and we're able to use sophisticated technology like machine learning with our local team um, and local capacity to actually integrate it within the solution without ne needing external help. And, and that's been incredibly successful in terms of getting the solution quickly off the ground and into the hands of providers and mums and help desk agents. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Priya Balu from the Public Health Foundation of India, who, along with my colleague Venus Rosales from 101 Health Research, will be presenting two case studies that examine the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning in primary healthcare and data analytics. Artificial intelligence is not one single, but rather a collection of technologies supporting a range of specific processes and tasks. Healthcare organizations are increasingly experimenting with AI in improving health service delivery, access, and quality. Our first case study examines a cardiac risk model developed to improve population health and provider effectiveness. This case study is from a health technology firm in India, that provides primary health care through nine hub clinics and 33 rural spoke health centers across seven states. The company provides a range of preventive diagnostic and curative services through a technology-enabled platform that supports the integration of discrete digital health services and devices. The challenge iCare wanted to address in its rural health model was the fact that heart diseases constitute more than 2.1 million deaths in India. Using its wireless health information system platform, iCure partnered with IBM to develop a cardiac risk assessment model to identify patients who were at a higher risk of an adverse cardiac event within a certain period and refer them to a hospital for further investigation and treatment. A cardiac risk model was created by combining data, AI, and machine learning with ECG signal anomalies to assist doctors in offering preventive care much faster in the diagnostic cycle. For this, 
The AIML algorithm was trained with basic patient data parameters of 50 patients that included gender, height, weight, blood pressure, et cetera, which was then overlaid with ECG data with 14 possible outcomes, creating about 700 patient data points. Using this, a two-step model was developed. The first step used basic patient history data where IQ's referral team of cardiologists prepared a preliminary ranking of cases that were a high risk for cardiovascular disease. In the second step, this was overlaid with ECG data captured from patients, which were shared with clinicians who then reprioritized cases at risk for CVD as high, medium, and low. Using this data overlay, the IBM Cloud Pack platform could stack rank and prioritize cases before and after ECG data was available. With the addition of new patient data, IBM could classify ECG data as normal or abnormal and develop high-risk patterns which could potentially predict a cardiac arrest in patients at a much earlier stage. So what are some of the findings and challenges? One of the interesting aspects of this model was its ability to detect algorithmic bias, which is the prediction of a greater likelihood of a disease on the basis of indicators that are not actual causal factors. In this case, a gender bias was flagged with more male patients being categorized as having a higher risk for CVD. This was largely because the model algorithm was fed with a greater amount of initial basic health and ECG data from male patients. The model also demonstrated 90% accuracy for 100 patients that were screened. It helped build a decision support system for cardiologists with greater transparency that handles bias. It also demonstrated flexibility to apply AI capabilities to a wide variety of data sources. The scope of the project, however, was to build a model which left challenges in validation. Demographically diverse data was required to improve the accuracy of the model. To overcome algorithmic bias, there was a need to train the algorithm with higher volumes of ECG and basic health data with a greater sample size of at least 1,000 patients. Regulatory requirements also needed to be addressed, such as data ownership, privacy, and security. I will now hand over the presentation to Venus, who will present the Philippines country case study. Over to you. From our projects in one one Health Research, we noted machine learning and network science to be commonly used, and we shall present our business use cases for this. Next. For machine learning, we aim to determine predictors of facility-based delivery among conditional cash transfer beneficiaries, and we aim to compare the efficiency of standard multivariate analysis with machine learning algorithms. Using logistic regression, our final R-squared was low at 8.05%. Using machine learning, we explored various algorithms. The best model was K-nearest neighbor classifier algorithm with a test accuracy of 80.72% to predict FBD utilization. Our takeaway was that regression techniques assume linear relationships while machine learning algorithms are able to take into account non-linear relationships, hence may be appropriate for complex questions in public health. Next. For network science, we map machine disease networks of two medical registries. These are bipartite networks because it involves two types of nodes, medicines and diseases. We hypothesized that we would see different networks for different diseases. However, we were surprised to see that the networks were tightly knit. In short, the same medicine combinations are used for more than 80% of the time. Our takeaway is that network science can be used to describe prescribing practices as well as predict drug utilization for procurement and planning. Next. Machine learning and network science are tools that should be considered when describing relationships for complex questions where traditional biostatistics may be limited in its assumptions. The use of these tools are not limited to big data, but also for complex data, which is not always big data. The tools are available and rapidly developing, but there must be infrastructure to support consistent routine data collection, governance, to support responsible data use and data sharing agreements. Clarity in the communications. The methods must follow the questions or the objectives and not the other way around. And therefore, the objectives must really be clarified. Next. AI systems will not replace human clinicians on a large scale, but will augment their efforts to care for patients. 
ethical implications include accountability, transparency, permission, privacy. Machine learning systems may be subject to bias and relies on the quantity and quality of good data for greater accuracy. With all these changes in AI in healthcare, it is important that institutions and regulatory bodies establish structures to monitor key issues and establish governance to limit negative implications. Next. Thank you for listening. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Godwin Anguzu, and I'm presenting from, uh, uh, from Uganda. I work with Infectious Disease Institute in uh, Kampala, Uganda. That's in East Africa. So uh, I'm just going to be talking about uh, machine learning to improve clinical care and resource utilization. That's uh, predicting schistosomiasis cases among people living with HIV in Uganda. Yeah. So just a brief uh, background of the study. Uh, despite uh, proliferation of health uh, data around the world and uptake, intel uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning techniques and application to achieve better outcomes have been very slow. In low and middle income countries, which uh, hold the greatest burden of disease, progress has been even lower, despite the potential for such uh, techniques to uh, for such techniques to inform the the most effective use of limited resources in unique populations. So in Uganda, the national prevalence of schistosomiasis is uh, uh, 25.6 percent, with the highest proportion infected among two to four year children, uh, according to Natal in 2019. Just to know that uh, schistosomiasis is actually also called bilharzia, and it's uh, it's it's really contracted from freshwater bodies uh, which are infested by uh, certain worms which then infect which then enter into the body and affect the liver and also the uh, other organs within the body like intestines so we just use a machine learning algorithms uh, testing about 15 machine learning algorithms to assess predictive value of schistosomiasis among hiv patients in the central region of the country so the central region of the country has uh, has also so many water bodies, and so uh, that is where our sample has gotten from. So just for the methods, among others living with HIV, re receiving antiretroviral therapy in Infectious Disease Institute in Kampala, Uganda, we carried out a cross-sectional study and collected uh, information, uh, clinical, demographic, and social characteristics uh, between 2015 and 2018. So um, we performed feature scaling and synthetic minority oversampling to reduce variability and balance data. So these are just pre-processing methods before applying machine learning algorithms. So 80% of observations were randomly selected for algorithm training and testing performed on remaining 20% observations. 15 machine learning algorithms were tested, each with a 10 focus validation method applied to avoid overfitting. Uh, parameter optimization and tuning was also performed to evaluate models with high uh, potential. So evaluation criteria included uh, prediction accuracies, area under the curve, sensitivity and specificity. Analysis was performed uh, also using the Python and Weka softwares. So just uh, in results, uh, out of 1,253 adults, uh, we, we, we got 36% uh, women who were included in the uh, study. So we identified uh, three models. Also, just to note that uh, the prevalence of schistosomiasis in the population was about 32%. Uh, so we identified three models that exhibited a very high performance. That was the support vector machines, the naive bias, and logistic regression. So just to look at the graph here, you can see that the support vector machine, uh, the accuracy was about 97%, followed by naive Bayes at 90%, then the logistic regression 
area under the curve again was the highest for SVM, support vector machine, followed by naive Bayes. Sensitivity highest was uh, naive Bayes, followed by support vector machine, and specificity highest was support vector machine. So overall, we can see that the support vector machine performed uh, highly uh, in relation to all the other methods that we used. And so just to continue the results uh, using the SVM, we found out uh, uh, the most relative important features uh, which help to predict uh, schistosomiasis in this unique population in a clinical setting. So among these included with a very high rank value or the most important features with highest rank values greater than 0 0.6 was the hepatitis B surface antigen positive, uh, hepatitis B core antibody positive, and hepatocellular carcinoma. We also had the jaundice, uh, which is yellowing of the eyes and uh, the skin, uh, palpable hepatomegaly, which is also like uh, largening of the liver. And we say that schistosomiasis really affects the liver and other organs in the body. So also another risk factor which we identified was occupation. Uh, you can see that the fishermen, uh, hoteliers, shock food, vending, and mechanics, these are mostly occupations which are carried out along the fishing uh, community or the freshwater bodies. And so uh, those are very important factors which really created uh, uh, schistosomiasis or predicted schistosomiasis in this population. So. Uh, just to conclude that, that machine learning techniques exhibit, exhibited very high performance in predicting schistosomiasis cases among people living with HIV. We present a methodology really for uh, testing a variety of algorithms on a real world healthcare data in a low income setting, selecting those best suited for the population and successfully identifying individuals in need of attention. So in contrast with the one size really fits all approach often utilized in global health interventions and policy making, we suggest such techniques can be really applied to clinical and public health interventions to get the allocation of limited healthcare resources in a personalized manner to diverse populations around the world. Uh, thank you very much uh, for hearing. Thanks very much to all of our panelists for those fantastic presentations. Really, really fascinating um, ex examples of, of machine learning. So we now have about 30 minutes to enter into a Q&A um, session with our panelists. And <clears throat> as we enter into this session, I, I'd like to invite the panelists to turn on uh, their cameras and, and audio as they answer some of these questions. First, I'd just like to reflect on some of what we've heard during this session and ask a few questions of the panelists um, and then go to what we see here um, in, in the questions coming up from, from those of you attending. So some really interesting things that I'm hearing across all of these presentations about machine learning and the benefits that it can bring to um, to not only the processes for providing health services, but also health outcomes in, in some instances. I think we're hearing a lot about um, the efficiencies that this brings. We're, we're talking about uh, resource constrained settings and several of the presenters mentioned um, allocations, for instance, that last presentation talking about allocation of, of limited resources based on the predictions of the machine learning. Um, others are, are talking about um, leveraging and using human resources for health in a, in a different way based on the predictions of, um, of these machine learning techniques, either for, for diagnosis or prediction of, of where uh, a particular disease occurs. Something that's really interesting is, is just how diverse um, these technologies are in, in the types of, of health um, healthcare and diseases that they are. Uh, focusing on. I mean, we heard about several delivery um, technologies, cardiac, NCD, schistosomiasis, and other infectious diseases. 
really fascinating. Um, and I think some of the questions that I have really focus on um, this question around integration and how now do we, uh, knowing some of what we know from the technologies and the machine learning that you all have studied, how do we see this um, integrating further into the health system and being scaled up in the health system? And I think there are questions clearly of um, behavior change, of um, finance, of uh, governance. So I, I, I'm very curious to hear from, from some of our panelists along those lines. And I, I believe we have a question similar to this. I might start with you, um, Dr. Miranda um, and the Rwanda work. Um, you mentioned a lot about the capacity building that was done and the training um, to operate this, uh, this technology, this, this um, photography technology, if you will. Um, and you talked about the training of the, the CHWs, which is one element of this. You also talked quite a bit about the training of the study team. I guess I wonder going forward, if um, this type of technology were to be rolled out at a, at a broader scale, how do you see this fitting into um, some of the, the workflows as one of our other panelists talked about of, um, of providers in the future? Is this something that you've thought about? Is this something that you've um, gathered research on in terms of best practices for really integrating this behavior um, and this technology in provider use going forward? So over to you, Dr. Miranda. Thank you so much, <clears throat> excuse me, and thank you again for having me, very excited to be here and um, really enjoyed all of the talks. So yeah, regarding your question, that is something that we're thinking about a lot. Um, and one of the reasons we really wanted to pay attention to the process is to make sure that we're doing it in a way that would be um, feasible if we wanted to upgrade this and you know make it more widespread within the, the community. Um, as many of you have probably heard the community health worker system in Rwanda has been very successful in a number of different areas, you know, um, malaria, nutrition, things like that. Um, our focus obviously is maternal health and specifically looking at post-operative care to see if that's something else that could be integrated um, into their work because their reach is so expansive. They were able to, you know, help reach out to patients in very remote areas who otherwise maybe wouldn't access care as quickly. So this is something, you know, part of our goal with this study. Um, it included a number of different, different um, kind of sub-studies within it. But the goal was to see if this is something that would be feasible, both from a network standpoint, you know, within the countries, is something that can be supported and where they would be able to use these photos um, in all these various regions within the country, but also um, on the community health worker level, because they're involved in so many different projects, does this fit in their current workload? So as part of that study, we are we did a qualitative component, which hopefully will be out soon, um, asking that of the community health workers, like, is this something that you could take on in addition? Um, and, you know, we're still analyzing the results, but in general, just anecdotally, the response was very positive. Um, so that's part of what we're thinking of moving forward as we develop this. Um, is it feasible? Will it fit into their workload? And what's the best way to, to roll it out? Um, and something that's very exciting too is the, the Ministry of Health of Rwanda actually has put in an order for, I think it's over 40,000 locally made smartphones to be distributed to all of their community health workers. Um, so these technologies like this, this image-based one, but also ones that have been talked about on the panel today could um, hopefully be integrated um, and be accessible to the community health workers throughout you know, all the villages in Rwanda and, and in other countries as well. Thanks very much, Dr. Miranda. That's, that's fascinating. And, and we'll look forward to that forthcoming research. Um, those qualitative studies sound like they will really help understand um, the system on the ground and, and how this can be integrated. I wanna to go to our colleagues in Kenya, um, Dr. Kumar at Strathmore, and I believe Sati, your colleague is also online. I'd like to hear a little bit more. You mentioned quite a bit about um, the need to, to leverage um, local expertise. Um, and you talked about how you are leveraging um, the system. I guess one, one thing that I'm really curious about is how do you understand the context and, and particularly the assets and, and tools that you have to work with when you're thinking about developing not just the technology, but also 
the process for the technology. And, and maybe I can give a better example of that. So thinking about, you know, who was in the system to begin with to be able to triage um, these questions and then to be able to identify those providers that could, could help with those answers. Maybe you could talk just a little bit more about the developing of this technology and process and, and how you do that. Uh, sure. Um, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and so I, I, off the bat, I'd like to say that uh, we find it much more hard to develop these processes and the technologies for use of machine learning uh, than the actual use of machine learning itself. Uh, so it's much more accessible right now to be able to take some data, put it through a machine learning algorithm and get some kind of classification happening. That's the easy part. Uh, the difficult part is getting these to be used uh, practically on the ground uh, with the kind of technologies that are available to the healthcare workers and their abilities. And so uh, that's uh, uh, the challenge that is different for each type of uh, application of machine learning. And um, so for example, for this specific uh, project with uh, trying to understand what symptoms need to be referred to, um, to the nurses and the healthcare professionals, the machine learning algorithm of uh, classifying SMS messages into um, a danger, a danger sign versus a not so uh, urgent sign, uh, that uh, has been relatively simple. I mean, no, um, uh, don't want to put down anything that uh, the machine learning algorithms actually need to do, but now taking that into a meaningful clinical workflow uh, is also a big challenge. Uh, and so what we've been doing is to try and say, how does a nurse who is on the ground, um, uh, who gets some of these messages, how best can she summarize this information to share it with somebody else? And so we've been using some handover techniques uh, that match up with future machine learning approaches. So for example, we use an SBAR uh, communications and documentation approach, uh, stands for situation, background, assessment and response. And if we, if we can get one sentence from a nurse about uh, each of these aspects of a patient, that becomes much more powerful to not only share to somebody else, uh, a clinician further down along the line, but also any algorithm that's gonna take this information and say, okay, I can further uh, build on an initial danger sign to say, what is the situation and where uh, can this patient be referred to or what resources uh, need to be aligned for this particular patient. So it's a, uh, it's a lot about matching the algorithm with the actual workflows, clinical knowledge, and the devices that they have with them. Thanks so much. That's really interesting and, and sounds like you are really assessing um, what you have to work with and, and then uh, leveraging that, um, that asset to be able to design this tool. I want to go now to our colleagues, um, Dr. Kumar and uh, Bohr, as well as um, our, our colleague in Uganda, Dr. Godwin. I think both of your presentations um, brought to mind to me that, that first of all, this is very um, rigorous uh, studies that you've um, conducted and, and really interesting outcomes, both about um, NCDs and infectious diseases. I'm curious to hear um, how in both of your settings um, you've thought about using these now for decision-making. Um, you, you mentioned the, the value that this can bring. And I guess I'm very curious, um, we've talked a little bit about allocation of, of limited resources, being able to identify patients that might be um, either more at risk or, or more likely to have um, an NCD or infectious disease. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about how you see this being used um, in the future. Let's start with our, our colleague in, um, in Uganda, Dr. Godwin, let me go to you. All right, uh, I don't know, I think I have an issue with my video here, but um, well, I uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to speak uh, in the meeting. Uh, I think, yeah, so uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, what I can say is that uh, they're very uh, powerful tools. And um, if you to look at the, uh, the analysis we did uh, using, uh, trying to look at the risk factors of schistosomiasis, uh, 
before this analysis, uh, there was another analysis which was done um, uh, again using elementary statistical softwares or tools uh, like the uh, like uh, other to other methods like logistic regressions and uh, the normal elementary statistical methods. So those very methods we were able to also uh, get certain risk factors. But again, we also uh, repeated the same study. Now we try to use now machine learning algorithm and see if we could you know explore more on uh, what kind of findings or more risk factors we could establish from this uh, very new methodology. So we employed uh, machine learning algorithms and you could see that at the end of it, we were able to uh, actually on top of the risk factors which were uh, established from, uh, from the elementary statistical methods, we were able to get more risk factors and even get the relative importance of uh, the different risk uh, uh, factors contributing to prediction of uh, histosomiasis. So uh, what I can say is that uh, some of the challenges, of course, uh, we are facing is uh, you know the, the the data quality. Uh, you know, there's rigorous kind of uh, data analysis which is required there. And then if you have to see that uh, we use only data from the central region, and I think uh, large volumes of data which could incorporate uh, the northern, maybe the eastern side, the western side could contribute more and stronger information and this is something which i believe uh, machine learning algorithms are really uh, good at if we could really uh, expand this analysis uh, to 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 bigger volumes of data and so uh, i think machine learning algorithms in this case really uh, have really helped us uh, to establish uh, something uh, uh, which is really going to impact on the future especially in Uganda, it's, it's, it's a new thing. People are studying every time to be able to really uh, come up with more uh, better and efficient ways of, of, of working on, on, uh, of, working on uh, uh, of, of utilizing data and big volumes of data. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nguzu. And, yeah. and just a follow-up question. It looks like we have a question for you here. What, which data sources were you using for the schistosomiasis study? Come on, again. The data sources for your study. Yeah, so the data sources we use for our study were really mainly at uh, the central, they are at Infectious Disease Institute, which is in the central part of the country. So uh, patients would come, you know, within uh, the facility. These are HIV patients, but also living in these uh, uh, these water body infested areas. So these are the, our main samples which we which we are using. Yeah, individuals from mainly the water uh, infested areas. Yeah. So we think Thank expanding you. this to, uh, to 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 the northern or other areas, which of course also have water bodies, would be would give us more information. Yeah. Thank you. Great, thank you. So it sounds like it's patient patient level data that you're using yeah. there from, from the clinics. Excellent. Yeah. Dr. Um, Krishna and, and, and Bohr, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, your findings. Um, really, really interesting uh, thinking about how this potential for um, machine learning to identify uh, some of these risk factors and, and also identify populations who are at greater risk um, for NCDs. Um, do you have uh, a sense of this technology being used currently um, in, in any states um, in India or whether this is, is upcoming um, in your, as your next steps in your work? Thank you, Cicely. Uh, this is only a pilot study at this stage. Uh, what I can say is like our study is about the indicators of health-related uh, outcomes and how it is related to a social demographic index kind of thing. So the social demographic index is based on uh, the average or in income per capita of a country and the total fertility rate and educational attainment. So how these health-related indicators are uh, connected with this SDA, social demographic index. 
So the a machine learning model have the ability or the potential to predict this the social demographic index from these health outcomes. So our future step will be to get more data. And so we know that there is always a constraint, data constraint in the health related study. So we are planning to get more data and uh, extend the study to the and learn a uh, an extensive kind of deep learning model to get more uh, dependable outcome, I mean more uh, outcomes from this study we are planning. And I request uh, Dr. Neelanjan to answer your question. Even. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Krishna. Uh, to talk about uh, data challenges in South Asia, it is really, you know, uh, uh, to speak about uh, at the local level and not even at the national level, data is available for the non-communicable diseases. And this makes actually a very difficult for us, you know, uh, to, to understand the situation at the country level and also at the regional level. So to, to, to think, you know, uh, to, 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 have, to have more kind of research in, in cities, it is required actually a lot of funding. So what we have seen actually, you know, funding is very less and, and the prevalence studies at the community and at the local level is very uh, limited. So, so those kind of studies actually need to be promoted and our study is trying to identify how the social determinants is linked with the NCT outcome and their risk factors. So uh, many studies, but what uh, literature says currently is actually, you know, it has estimated, uh, it has analyzed the, uh, the, the NCT button at the country level but not analyzed, you know, in depth how social determinants is linked with the NCD burden and its risk factors. So we are trying to, you know, establish that linkage through our analysis in this uh, paper currently, and try to develop a lot of, you know, uh, 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 extensive uh, analysis based on the based on the data availability at the regional level. So that you know how to take that uh, take the machine learning uh, analysis forward uh, from our current analysis and do much more in-depth analysis for that to understand how this linkage work in this uh, Southeast Asian level. Great, thank you so much for that. Really fascinating work. I want to go now to um, Dr. Priya Balu and Dr. Her colleague, Dr. Rosales. I think something that really struck me in your presentation, I, I believe it was Dr. Rosales that mentioned this, is thinking about the possibilities of machine learning for um, dealing with complexity. And I think you could talk about that maybe on a, a couple of levels, but something that, that strikes me is, is the ability or the efficiency that it brings to a, a huge amount of information or data that any one provider needs to take into account. And I guess I'm wondering, how do you see that moving forward? Is that something indeed that you saw in your work that, that machine learning really has the possibility of, of acting as a tool for, um, you know, I think someone had said something about humans aren't going anywhere, but um, using this machine learning as a tool, um, how, how can it really help us uh, deal with complexity in um, healthcare provision settings? Um, I'm, I'm just trying to see if Venus is on, and if she's not, then I'll take a shot at that question. Venus, are you on? Okay, it's, it's, I think it's, it's late Philippines time, but um, so, I mean, I think, uh, you know, when we were comparing both our case studies, two things really, um, uh, you know, kind of emerged. One is that, you know, machine learning has this ability to really play with data uh, in many levels. Um, you know, for example, we could analyze non-linear data, we could analyze linear data, you can have different levels of data that could actually be converged. Um, and it's really about uh, the kind and type and 
quality of data that you can really feed into an, algor an, an algorithmic uh, kind of um, uh, response. And then, and then uh, what machine really learning does is it has the ability to predict, it has the uh, uh, ability to triage, and it has the ability to integrate. So for the IQO model, what was really fascinating is that they already had this uh, platform called the wireless um, health incident uh, monitoring platform. It was a patented platform that they used whereby they were actually already being able to um, kind of uh, integrate discrete technologies um, in rural and semi-urban areas. So they were already applying, say, uh, you know, eye care uh, technology from Oro Labs, which was being in integrated into that platform. They had numerous devices, which was diagnostic, screening, um, and, and uh, devices that were used by community health workers to kind of monitor uh, populations already being in, uh, kind of integrated. What was unique about our model was that iCure then partnered with IBM that began to kind of use machine learning to see whether, you know, cardiac risk assessment could actually be triaged um, at a non-hospital level. So by actually ranking, you know, cardiac cases that were captured by the community health worker and then used mobile, you know, telemedicine technology to have your, a cardiologist sitting at the hub clinic to be able to then further triage it to say a hospital level was a very unique proposition. But we also saw the flip side of it in that while it was no doubt exciting to kind of compress and create these 700 data points that came out of all the varying combinations, we also had to be careful about the kind of baseline data that we were collecting. And what IBM's model did was actually to flag those biases. So, you know, when we started, you know, for example, you know, when we started moving through the data, the first indicator came that, that there was a red flag that came up. I didn't show that in my presentation because of paucity of time, uh, but then it said uh, there is a male bias. And then it says there were more male patients who had a greater predilection for cardiac complications. And then when we kind of dug deeper into the data itself, we discovered that there were more male patients uh, whose preliminary data points were fed into the algorithm. So I guess, you know, it's, it's almost uh, when you're looking at in machine learning, it's uh, it's almost like be careful of what you wish for, or be careful of what you feed uh, into that algorithm, uh, because that's what's going to be uh, eventually, uh, you know, kind of represented, uh, whether it's triaging or integration or otherwise. So I think, uh, you know, the future of healthcare is complex, but machine learning is going to play a very, very important role in supplementing and complementing a lot of healthcare decisions. How we supplement and complement them depend on how we use that data, what kind of data we have uh, in terms of access, and what kind of environments uh, we are going to allow to allow this kind of data manipulation to flourish. Because at the end of the day, it's about manipulating data to offset or complement uh, medical decision making or decision making at a community level. Um, so unless there are you know, checks and balances in place, or even adequate data to kind of feed in, um, because, you know, AI deals with large amounts of data. I mean, this is, you know, absolute, it's white noise out there when it comes to data. But I think one has to be careful in, in, in the kind of data that you use, uh, how that data is being presented, and what kind of environments we are going to kind of enable uh, to, to make best use of that kind of data. So that was my, uh, you know, my experience with the IQ model. And I'm, I'm sure Venus had her own uh, take on when she was look, looking at drug prescription pass, patterns. But really, it was, it was really about, um, I think, how machine learning could take complex data and do very interesting things with it. And so I think that offers a completely, uh, you know, different perspective on how data itself can be read, not only by policy, but also in practice. Yeah. So. Thanks very much, Priya. That's really interesting. And I think one of the most important points there is, is, is the, uh, the idea of, is it good data to begin with? Um, it, it, what, are we, what are we looking at? The decisions that we're making are, are only um, going to be effective if the data that we're using um, in this machine learning is, is valid and accurate. 
we have one quick we have time i think just for one more discussion topic between the groups here uh, between the the presenters here i think we have about six minutes left this has been really interesting um, and exciting to see these kinds of technologies and machine learning from very different settings across the planet really um, but Pratap has, has suggested a question for us here as a group, trying to understand a little bit more about what the local resources are in each of these settings um, for collecting the data on uh, machine learning. So maybe uh, if I'll open this up to the group to see who wants to, to jump in. We just have about four minutes here. Um, is there anyone who'd like to address that comment first? So the question is the use of local resources. Um, if can, Pratap, can you just kind of rephrase the question? Uh, sure. Uh, and um, uh, like many of the panelists have touched upon the need for data, good data, and uh, ideally local data, right? So you want data from the setting where you want to apply it. And, uh, and then you want to run these algorithms um, ideally locally as well, because you don't want uh, too much disparity or it's not sustainable to have uh, the people who work on this local problem be far away. And so I was uh, pushing this discussion into the future of use of uh, machine learning to say how much can all of this be done locally, both the generation of the data and use of machine learning algorithms locally instead of you know, relying on multinational companies uh, to do that for example, or universities, for example. Well, I can take a shot at it. I mean, I, I think the fact that iCure is a local company and, and was able to look at, you know, local data. So the data that was generated for the cardiac care model really came from a small village in Midnapur in uh, West Bengal. Um, so I think local data is available and is being increasingly used. Um, the challenge that I also see happening is that because uh, uh, you know information technology and innovation using technology is so diverse and so dispersed, there are many chunks of local data being collected by by you know different providers across different spaces. So you know iCure is one provider, and then there are others. There's ReadyMe, and there's, you know so there, there are different. I would say fragments or silos of data being collected. Uh, some of it uh, local data, some of it from local hospitals, um, some of it from local communities. But I guess in answer to your question, I think the need to collect locally available good data, uh, I think is more important than ever before. And I think COVID-19 has changed that paradigm almost entirely. So uh, I think when we wake up in the morning, what we're really seeing is a huge amalgam of local data by many countries, many provinces, and many states. So the paucity of local data that I think was a challenge in many low middle income uh, country settings might change with COVID, um, uh, simply because there has been a pivot to really understanding that to understand health systems better, to understand populations better, there has to be good quality local data. However, once that data is collected, what we do with that data and how we kind of uh, assimilate it, integrate it, um, and play with it, um, I think is a challenge that, that I think is, a, is an ongoing process uh, more than anything else. I don't think I have an answer to that. Thanks so over you. to anyone else. Anyone else want to jump in on that question? No. Great. Well, I think. Hello. Um, oh, please. Yes, Dr. Nguzu, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll agree with the previous uh, speaker about uh, yeah the really enormous challenge of uh, of using this data. I'll speak for our situation here in Uganda, the local situation. Uh, now what is happening is that there's a lot of data which is being uh, collected by different organizations, different companies. However, the technology to really utilize this data and bring out uh, relevant information which can help in decision-making is uh, still very low. And uh, there are few people who are really uh, trying to embrace these technologies here. And uh, most people are just wondering what 
you know, how to utilize this data. Uh, initially, we did uh, this analysis using uh, elementary statistical methods, uh, using elementary statistical tools. You realize that uh, with very huge volumes of data, some of these uh, methods uh, can end up not converging. They don't converge. They, you know, but when you use machine learning algorithms, they're very powerful techniques uh, with very huge computational power required. And uh, you realize that it, this kind of computational power is again lacking. And uh, so in one of the algorithms which I was running, I, was, I, I took almost uh, a week, uh, you know. So some of uh, uh, these things will require a lot of uh, computational power, uh, which again is, is lacking. And also, uh, of course, we need to do more of these uh, research methods to put them outside there so that stakeholders can, you know, pick up these things and, you know, help to promote such kind of technologies in our settings and all that. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nguzu. And I'm being told here that I have not shared the results of the poll that's live. Um, so I will do that uh, maybe just verbally with you now because I've, I, I think maybe he's done this for you, for me, but you can see that um, I think, first of all, we had quite a few participants on this panel. We had about uh, just under 50, I believe. And um, of those, it, it looks like the, the majority of folks are, are somewhat familiar with artificial intelligence and machine learning, but hopefully have learned quite a bit more from this, um, from this panel and particularly its use in, in uh, resource constrained and limited settings. So I just want to thank all of the panelists here. We are at time. This has been a really fantastic setting. I also want to thank um, our tech support for making this happen for all of us around the world at absolutely uh, different points of our day from our homes. Um, thank you for that. Uh, wishing you all um, a good day and also um, health and safety in this difficult time. I think for most of you, I'll say good evening and good night. For me, it's the start of my day here and this was a wonderful start to the day. So thank you for allowing me to moderate this panel um, and, and look forward to the ongoing research that this group of, of panelists um, will produce. So thanks very much.